uh, the, the speaker, so Giuseppe Carleo. So uh, Giuseppe finished actually his PhD here in Trieste, in CISA, some time ago, after which he did his postdoctoral studies in uh, Institute of TIC in France and also in ETH Zurich in Switzerland. Then he joined Flatiron Institute, I think, in New York. And since recently, he's a professor at TPFL, where he has his uh, research group. So uh, we're happy to have you here, Giuseppe, and uh, please go on with your lecture. Uh, th thank you, Asia, for, uh, for, the, for the introduction. And also, of course, uh, thank to all the organizers for having me here today. Uh, I'm, I'm always very happy to be at ICTP, even though this time only virtually, and I will have to skip the nice view of the sea. But uh, uh, I'm really uh, happy that this school could still be done uh, uh, online. So today, I mean, I will, I will tell you more about um, um, mostly the applications of what Filippo has started uh, uh, introducing in his, uh, in his uh, lecture. Um, and this is, uh, as, you, as you've understood, essentially applications of machine learning ideas to many body, essentially interacting uh, quantum uh, systems. And uh, as you, you are seeing also during uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this conference, this, uh, this, uh, this school, uh, this is part of a much broader, if you want, um, things that is happening in, in the context of physics, which is the application of machine learning to several realms of physics from particle physics to chemistry, statistical physics, uh, and also what we are going to talk about today is mostly uh, quantum physics. And you will also see more, I guess, from, from Juan Carasquilla um, in, the, in the next uh, uh, lecture. Um, so this is a review where you can find uh, somehow a, an overview of what's going on in the field and all the you know, explosive developments that have happened in the past uh, couple of years. Now, uh, just as a, as a short one slide uh, summary of what you've seen uh, during uh, the last uh, talk, what you've seen is uh, essentially this idea of neural network quantum states. And uh, again, so these are a parameterization of your variational wave function sides so of your quantum state, again, the state describing uh, a complex quantum system. And what you do is that you have a nonlinear function that given an arbitrary set of you know, quantum numbers, for example, spin quantum numbers or electronic positions, or whatever you have in your, in your quantum system, will return, I mean, will output uh, the, uh, the amplitude, you know, psi sigma, psi s, s is the ensemble of these quantum numbers. Uh, and these, uh, essentially, these uh, quantum numbers, these, uh, these amplitudes of the wave function that are complex, as you know, in general, will depend parametrically. So this is why this is called a variational approach on some parameters, for example, those in a, in a deep neural network. So you've seen this form, uh, maybe not written this way, but you've seen this during the, the initial lecture. So this is a deep network where you, you, you read it from the right to the left. And the first variable that you see here is a vector S, which is the ensemble of your quantum numbers, for example, plus or minus one if you have a spin system. Then you have a linear transformation. So you apply a matrix W. These are your parameters, the thing that you can change. Uh, and then you apply component wise so to all the entries of these vectors, vector, uh, a nonlinear function G, for example, a ReLU or any other nonlinear function that you've seen during the other lectures. And you do this operation a lot of times until you reach the final layer, so-called, of, of the network, uh, where you will have, in this specific case, only one output. So this only one output is, uh, for a given choice of the input quantum numbers, the amplitude of the wave function. Okay? So this, if you want, bracket uh, value. Okay? So this is the main idea of these neural network quantum states. And then, I mean, as also Filippo was uh, anticipating, and uh, you've seen also maybe in the previous lectures, the, one of the reasons why we want to use this kind of approximations is that they are uh, uh, very powerful. So nonlinear functions are very powerful at describing highly dimensional uh, objects or highly dimensional functions. This is based on uh, some theorems. Uh, these are somehow modern reformulations of a famous theorem by Kolmogorov and Arnold um, at the beginning of the 1900. Uh, and these are written in, in terms of uh, uh, neural networks. Uh, essentially, what this theorem say is that uh, if you have a sufficiently large neural network, so if you have sufficiently many neurons, 
then you can represent an arbitrarily high dimensional function provided it is sufficiently uh, regular. So regular means not, not crazily infinite at some point and other things. Uh, and these continuous. Um, these conditions are typically met by wave functions and that's uh, why we also use uh, these, uh, these, uh, these neural networks to describe wave functions, but as you've seen the other applications they're used in many other cases to the correct images and all of that. Now, from a physical point of view, you might have also heard about entanglement. So entanglement is this property of wave functions or quantum system that essentially if I make a measurement on, on some part uh, of the system here uh, that is uh, far away from another part of the system, let's call this part A and the other part B, then uh, the, the property of entanglement is that uh, the, 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 essentially the outcome, the outcome of this measurement A on A will influence directly uh, successive measurement that I, that I do on B, the other part of the right? And uh, the, the, you can show, it is possible to show, that if you have a parameterization of your state in terms of a neural network, you can actually quantum system, which is entanglement, even if these two parties, A and B, are uh, very far apart. So this is uh, uh, what is uh, some, sometimes called volume law. So essentially the, the scaling of this entanglement that goes like the volume of the system uh, and not like the surface as in, uh, in some other, other case. Uh, for example, if you have a deep network, like a convolutional network that I'm sure you've seen in the previous lectures, uh, it has been shown that with, if you want to encode these uh, long range correlations, essentially the, uh, in this long range entanglement, the, uh, the, the depth of the network should scale at most, uh, essentially polynomially, so polynomially fast with the number of spins, the number of degrees of freedom that you have in the system. So this is a very important property because this tells you that you don't need exponentially many large, exponentially large neural networks, for example, to describe this uh, fundamental property of quantum system, which is intact. Now, uh, as Filippo was also mentioning, there are mainly two applications. So one, which is about simulating quantum system, and this is what both me and Filippo will focus on uh, today. Uh, but there is also another part of the story, which is about uh, uh, characterizing quantum hardware or somehow learning, uh, if you want, wave functions from experiments. So if I have an experiment with a, that contains, so to speak, a certain wave function, I can try to, to represent that wave function on my computer using these representations. This is not what I'm going to talk about today because we don't have enough time, but I will concentrate on applications in the, in the first realm, so simulating quantum systems. It should be stressed, uh, this is very important, that uh, um, this is, uh, these kind of applications are relatively different from uh, the, the, the kind of applications you've already seen, I guess, during this, uh, this school, um, where you have data sets. So in standard applications of machine learning, you have a lot of data that is generated by, uh, for example, images that are taken of cats or dogs. And then you, for example, try to classify these images uh, with this very large database. Um, However, in the applications that we do here, we don't use databases, but in a sense, we self-generate these databases. So this is the, the sampling step that Filippo was discussing uh, uh, for a long part of his talk uh, that is essential to compute, for example, expectation values of quantities in quantum systems. So in this sense, uh, this kind of applications is self-learning in the sense that we don't have an external pre-solved solution of our problem, but we try to find it uh, on the fly. So this is similar to somehow learning yourself to how to walk without having somebody that shows you how to walk. Okay, now uh, concerning the simulation of quantum systems, uh, again, there is several applications. Uh, one is uh, if you want to find the ground state of a given Hamiltonian H, an approximation of this ground state or some excited states, or simulate unitary dynamics. So solve if you want the Schrodinger equation, the time independent Schrodinger equation. Or uh, there are even cases where we actually solve uh, approximately for the dynamics of the density matrix of the, of the, of, of the system. Okay. So this is for open systems, if you want, or finite temperature, somebody, in some cases, as somebody will say, ask me. So let's focus again uh, first on this part of the story, which is the ground state search. Uh, you've seen from Filippo, again, one slide reminder that what we do is that we we consider the variational principle, so the expectation value of the, 
property of the Hamiltonian, so the thing that describes the interaction in my system. And we know that this expectation value is strictly larger than exact ground state temperature. So what we do is that we try to minimize this quantity uh, E of W as a function of the W that are in the parameters that are in the, in the neuron. So, and a very important point is that you can rephrase this as, a, as, a, as an expectation minimization problem. So I have a probability distribution, which is a, this psi squared as Philip was outlining, um, and we minimize essentially expectation values of a quantity that is this local energy introduced by Filippo over this probability distribution. Okay. So this is the main step that we do during this uh, optimization, if you want, this learning, uh, variational learning of the neural net. Now, uh, this, again, I won't go uh, too much into the details of the theory because you've seen already some uh, with Filippo. I will give you some uh, applications, an idea of the application that, uh, the flavor of what we can do. So um, the, the first kind of, uh, of applications, I mean, that we do, for example, in, uh, in condensed matter is, is about studying uh, interacting, for example, uh, spin models, right? So you know that in some cases you can describe, you can have a Hamiltonian, an effective Hamiltonian for even an electronic system, uh, for a system of interacting electrons that reduces only to spin the degree of freedom. So we freeze somehow the the, the translational, uh, if you want, degrees of freedom, so the fact that the electrons can go around, we measure that they are on a square lattice, for example, like in this case, and then what is left are only spin up or down degrees of freedom for, for these electrons, okay? So one famous model, uh, which is uh, what I will discuss about today, is the, this uh, kind of uh, family of models where you have uh, uh, what is called an exchange, uh, I mean, uh, what is called an Eisenberg interaction. So, so essentially you have a pheromon, uh, an interaction between spin uh, SI and J. So these are vectors of polymatrices interacting on two sides, if you want, of this uh, two dimensional square lattice. At for, so, the, for example, only the nearest neighbors of this lattice. This is, this is the first term here. And then you can have also interactions at second nearest neighbors. So, this is this J2 term on the diagonal of the square lattice. Okay? And I mean, one reason why we use this model as a benchmark is because, um, first of all, it's easy to write down, and also because we don't know its phases uh, exactly because it's very hard to solve. We don't have any other technique that can be used to solve this either analytically or uh, computationally in a, in a controlled way. Okay? So for example, one question that we would like to understand in this model is, is if when J2, so this interaction is comparable to this other guy, J1, you can have a phase of Uh, sorry, I think we lost sound. Giuseppe, we lost it. Okay. Sorry, what? We lost the, uh, the sound for a while. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So I, I was saying that uh, this uh, spin liquid phase would be a disordered uh, phase uh, of matter of these spins, which uh, essentially um, uh, contrasts uh, the, the, these um, disordered cases where you, for example, when J1 so uh, dominates, so this part dominates, you have this kind of ordering. And or when J2 dominates, you have this other kind of, of ordering, this right ordering on the, on the vertical or the horizontal line. Okay. Uh, so the question uh, that we'd like to understand is then uh, essentially find good approximations of the ground state of this very challenging uh, model. So one way to do this uh, that we, we, we started doing in these uh, in this works uh, is essentially to take a neural network, which is a convolutional neural network, this very successful uh, architecture that people use in image recognition problems to recognize cats and dogs, and use them as a wave function, okay? So a two-dimensional wave function. So we take this kind of architecture that I guess you've already seen during these, these lectures, and uh, um, the, uh, the, uh, we use these kind of representations. So, so here, the, the weights, uh, so the, are, are essentially the ends of these matrices, these square matrices that are called also filters in Jericho. Okay. Um, and then, I mean, what we can do is try to see what, what is the accuracy that we get on the energy of the ground state for some, uh, uh, for some uh, cases, uh, for, for some values of this J2 and J1, so for some values of the problem. So if we take, uh, first of all, J2 equals zero, so in this Hamiltonian, when we take this, so we, when we don't consider these interactions, we only consider this interaction here, this is called this, this is the standard Eisenberg model. What, what I brought here is essentially the, the, the error that you make on the energy that you can compute exactly in this case with other techniques. 
uh, compared to the size of the network that we have. So here we use the, an RDM that Philip was also talking about, and alpha is the width essentially of the neural network. So the larger alpha, the, 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 the wider is the neural network. So this is a, a shallow, very shallow, just one layer essentially neural network, but that you can uh, make more expressive by enlarging like this horizontal. So, and you see that, I mean, at that time we, we were able already to to improve some of the, at the time, uh, best uh, rational results that people were, were obtaining on, on this model with general uh, with function answers. Um, and, uh, you know, if you start using uh, networks that are also, you know, more expressive because they are deep. So here we are not using uh, deep networks, just these simple one layer, so very simple minded you know, networks. But if you know, if you play a bit more and you, you increase the depth and uh, um, you, you use them closer to the state of the art uh, networks. You can also systematically improve these, and uh, I will show you later also how you can even uh, go beyond these, uh, these, uh, these results. So, you see that here, for example, the error that you make on the energies of the order of 10 to the Now, um, the um, 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 the thing becomes challenging when you start uh, turning up this uh, J2 interaction. So this uh, uh, second, so this, this interaction of the diagonals of, of the square lines, right? So the J2 again is uh, are the interactions of J1 is the interaction between uh, nearest neighbors on uh, the square. So I have a spin here, a spin here. This is my J1 interaction between these two spins and J2 is instead the interaction between on the diagonal of, of, of the square lines. Okay, um, and uh, so and things and um, becomes uh, challenging and uh, unsolved essentially when you turn on this J two. So there is no way we can solve the, the problem exactly when J two is different from zero. Um, so in this limit, I mean, in this case, uh, you can see what the only thing that we can do is to compare, for example, the accuracy of our method to. Uh, so this is typical of variational methods. The only thing we can do is to compare the energy, for example, that we get with other energies that people have obtained uh, in the past or are obtaining as we speak uh, on this model using other approaches. Okay? So for example, people have used the PMRG, Medix powder states. Um, Quando Monte Carlo can, use, can be used again only uh, for this specific point of J2 equals zero, where you don't have the same problem. Um, and then there were also other applications based on, based on other variational wave functions, uh, et cetera. So what you see here, essentially the difference between the, the energies obtained with these, all these techniques and our energies. So essentially, when um, these points are up in this upper plane, it means that we have lower energies. So in principle, a better approximation for, for the ground state. Otherwise, uh, when uh, you see these kind of points, it means, for example, that in this specific case, the MRG would have a, a slightly better energy uh, than, than our best approximation uh, of, uh, as of 2019. Okay. So this is uh, the state of the art uh, for in 2019 for this problem. And you can see that essentially, apart from a small part of the phase diagram, we were already, this neural network can really help you in finding better approximations for the ground state and possibly also solve some, uh, some open problems. I have to say that nowadays we, we, are, we know also how to improve this around here and uh, hopefully we'll see soon some um, new works where actually on, all over the phase diagram uh, the neural network will, will have essentially the best uh, approximation for, for the ground state. Now, there is of course challenges and uh, reasons for, for, for improvements as in, uh, in all uh, techniques, in all approaches. Uh, and uh, um, this is what the things that uh, I think it's uh, very important to discuss and understand also in, in this context, okay? So one uh, uh, reason for, uh, for, for, for the challenge, for example, if you want, if you go at this 0.5, so somebody has already noticed it, but you see that here, I mean, why would this point be? more challenging than others, right? So one of the reasons is that, uh, uh, that has been pointed out in this paper is essentially the, the number of samples that you need to, to, to generate. So essentially how many times you have to do this Markov chain that Philip was talking about during his lecture uh, in order to, to get uh, a good uh, estimate, uh, if you want a good uh, hint of how the ground state properties look like. So for example, in this paper, the, what they did is that they studied the, the, the overlap. So essentially, how good is the approximation of your ground state uh, with, a, with even neural network? 
as a function of the number of samples. This is a quantity which is proportional to the number of samples. So you see that uh, uh, what you see is a very nice phase transition actually. And you see that uh, you need a certain number of, of samples in order to get a, a good accuracy. And uh, I mean, what they found is that uh, when you have strong frustration, so essentially when J2 is comparable to J1 uh, for a similar problem, but not exactly the same, but uh, pretty much related, uh, it can happen that the number of samples that you need is, uh, is pretty large because essentially the, the kind of problems that you are trying to learn are very disordered. So it might be that also to learn this kind of properties, you need also to see a lot of different configurations. So this is one of the limitations, if you want, of these learning-based approaches that are based on the number of samples. However, I mean, and this is quite uh, crucial, important, it seems that the critical number of samples to, to, to learn, if you want to approximate these wave functions with a given accuracy, which is not too bad, seem, doesn't seem to scale uh, at this point, even though we only have uh, small systems, uh, because these studies are very hard to do for larger systems, but it seems that the scaling is not too bad. So in the sense that if you have 20 spins, you need of the order of 10 to the three samples, even for very challenging models. If you have 36 spins, it seems that you have, you need maybe 10 times more, but not 1 million or 20 million more samples. So this uh, hints to the fact that uh, hopefully this idea that also well, Filippo was showing uh, that uh, uh, essentially given this large Hilbert space or vector space in this case of quantum systems, uh, we only want to describe a small portion of it parameterized by, by, by neural network, a series of neural networks. Uh, then uh, uh, indeed this is somehow a correct image in the sense that um, uh, we, we can hope that for ground state of physical systems, this part can be addressed using uh, a number of parameters which is not exponentially large. This is a hope, it's very hard to prove uh, analytically. There are non uh, artificial counterexamples, but in practical systems, we see that this, uh, this uh, typically uh, works. Uh, there is an improvement over um, the, the, the old things, uh, older things that I was discussing uh, until now, and that Philippe also was, uh, was telling me about. So this idea of uh, doing Markov chain to samples, so to generate these many samples okay, from, from the wave function. So this can be proved even further. Uh, I will not go into too much into the details, but I will just tell you that there is a family, if you want, of, uh, of neural networks that are called uh, autoregressive uh, neural networks. That can be generalized, uh, as we've done in this work, to quantum systems. And this uh, family of neural networks uh, satisfies the property that they can um, be, you, you can essentially sample from these quantum states without doing Marco Chain Monte Carlo and in a completely efficient way. Okay. So these are uh, really the, the, the incarnation of what, of the definition of computationally tractable quantum states that uh, Van den Nest was introduced and that Filippo was, uh, was alluding to during his, uh, his, uh, his presentation. So just to give you a flavor of how these, uh, these things work, but essentially uh, you, you have to uh, make sure that your filters in the neural network are such that uh, uh, the, the correlations here depend only on the previous spins and not on the, on, the, on, the, on the successive one. So you do a sort of decomposition of the wave function in terms of conditionals, even though these are not probabilities, but complex objects. Uh, and then you can uh, efficiently impose these uh, quantum conditionals if you want to normalize to one. So, uh, again, I, I will not go into much into the details, but this will uh, allow you to do exact sampling and you don't need to do this, uh, this Markov chain uh, metropolis sampling uh, anymore. Uh, so just to give you an idea of how good these things are, uh, if you take again the, the case of the Asimov model, uh, which is an important benchmark, you see that uh, if, you, if you use this uh, exact sampling approach and also much deeper network, you can you know crank down your go down in your inaccuracy, so improve your accuracy of more than a factor, I mean a factor of ten or so. Uh, compared to, to standard deep neural networks. And at a point that is between the 10 to, to minus five, where, I mean, essentially this problem is uh, to all practical purposes exactly solved. Okay, so these kind of new ideas that are really influenced by machine learning are, 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 are also making a, an impact in, uh, in techniques uh, now that are used to study variational equality. Now, I mean, uh, um, 
there is uh, uh, so maybe uh, some um, uh, okay so maybe I will I will take just uh, one uh, or two questions at this point before moving to the next topic uh, so there is a question which is from uh, Giancarlo Frances who's asking what about uh, spin glasses and what so what about finite temperature results so I'm not sure what you mean by spin glasses so, so you mean uh, classical spin glasses um yes so uh what about that um i'm not sure i i, I got the question can you can you maybe can you can you yeah can you unmute yourself okay carlo you you can talk now if you can unmute yourself hello can you hear me yes Yes, thank you. So, um, yeah, I was asking about spin glasses. So, when you not only have frustration, but also disorder. Ah, okay. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, then, that's the case that uh, that we have not studied uh, in uh, in this case, but uh, can be addressed. Uh, that, that's I mean, uh, that it's uh, so this family of models, for example, has been used classically to study spin glasses. Right. Where, where this, this instead of psi as a p, so a Bolts, you try to approximate uh, the Boltzmann distribution with uh, with a family of autoregressive classical models. I mean, now I don't want to enter too much into this, but I mean, uh, uh, yes, you can do that too. There's no, no no problem in doing that. But again, the issue will be the number of samples that you need to learn a spin glass. Uh, right. That, the, that's my question. If there is any results about that, if anybody did something about that. No, uh, not uh, in the quantum case. No. Okay, and and uh, and so you are only interested in in finite temperature. So you don't don't mean the quantum case is only related to the finite temperatures. So the, the zero zero temperature. Sorry, so you are not concerning the uh, any finite temperature case, right? Oh, so in this case, I'm only uh, discussing about the ground states, but uh, I will show you an example later of also exact states. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so. Um, um okay so pa, pa, pa. so there is a, okay this other question which is is there a conceptual reason why NQS doesn't work when j2 uh, i wouldn't say it's larger than 0.5 but it's actually around 0.5 as you can see from, from this uh, this thing here okay because for for larger sorry for for larger values of uh, of of uh, of j2 you see that our approximation is good i mean i remind you that if these points are up it means that we are doing better uh, so you see that it's around 0.5 where we don't, uh, I mean, in this again, in this paper uh, two, two years ago, we were not performing as well as the MRG. So the reason that I was telling you about is because of this sampling. Uh, so essentially the number of samples that you need to learn this disordered phases. Um, okay, so now I will, I will move maybe to, to, the, to the second part uh, to, uh, of, of my talk and discuss about um, uh, something which is uh, pretty um, quite important i mean uh, for i guess for those of you who, who will uh, be interested in their future research activity in, in studying uh, uh, electronic properties or all sorts of uh, other um, things related to uh, to interaction of of, of electrons okay? so um what uh, what I will discuss now is uh, indeed how you how do we address uh, one of the most fundamental symmetries of, of nature, which is essentially the the, the exchange symmetry. Right? So uh, so the fact that when you have two fermions, the wave function should to change sign. Right? So this is one of the main uh, the first thing that you learn when you when you, when you take a, a higher level course in quantum mechanics. Now the main uh, I mean one of the things that you can do, which is not the only one, but uh, one that is uh, um, the, the one that I will discuss today, uh, what you can do is that uh, there is a way, for example, if you have fermions on, on the lattice, to map these fermions onto a spin problem. Okay? So there is, for example, a very famous mapping that was devised by Jordan uh, in Wigden um, that essentially allows you, for example, to map a generic uh, fermionic Hamiltonian, so Hamiltonian where you have electrons, onto a Hamiltonian of spins. Okay? Um, I will tell you in a second about this mapping. But there are also other mappings, for example, this um, maybe less known in condensed matter mapping, but this is due by Bravi and uh, Kitaev, um, which is also a way to map fermions to spin in a way which is, uh, um, for some cases, in some cases, uh, you know, better suited for, for especially for, for simulations 
um, uh, with quantum computers, but also in some cases with classical computers. So I will give you maybe just a rough idea of what the Jordan Winger mapping is, but uh, I mean, maybe you know that if you have fermions, you can describe them with uh, uh, the so-called raising and lowering operators, uh, fermionic operators C and C dagger. So these are uh, anti-commuting operators. And the idea of this mapping is that you can uh, essentially turn this, uh, for example, this uh, distraction operator for the fermion C on a, on a, for, for a fermion inside J um, onto a spin operator with, that has a, a lowering matrix, a sigma minus, Pauli sigma minus, on the same side times a string, so-called string operator of products of sigma Z on, on the previous side. So this, if you want this string, and cause the sign of, of, this, of, this, of this configuration. Okay. The same thing can be done on, on for sigma dagger. And it can be, uh, using this very simple rule, you can essentially transform any Hamiltonian containing fermionic degrees of freedom into a spin Hamiltonian of this form. So if you want, you can turn the, um, the if you want the generic uh, discrete uh, problem for fermions into a problem of spins. And then we can use all the machinery we've developed so far for spins exactly in uh, this. Uh, there is an alternative mapping. Uh, unfortunately, I won't have time to go too much into uh, how this works because it's a bit involved by Bravi and Kitaev. And the, the, the main reason why this mapping is interesting is because uh, instead of mapping these operators on two uh, objects, like in this case that have uh, n body interactions. So you see that here I'm making interact through this product, uh, essentially n spins. So a lot of so this is an n body interaction. It's a very unphysical in a sense. Um, the, the the main advantage of this other mapping by Brian and Kitaf is that these the interactions that you that arise in the spin Hamilton are are quasi local, not exactly local, but quasi local. So they only involve at most the log of n number of spins. Okay. So this is something that can be used also in practical classical simulations uh, in, in our application. Now, just to give you one example, uh, uh, we've applied this approach to, to some small molecules, essentially to, again, these are fermions, to, uh, to benchmark against other approaches that people use, for example, in quantum chemistry. So this is the case of two molecules, uh, C2 and, uh, and two, the, so two dimers of so carbon and nitrogen. Um, and you can see that, um, so what I'm showing here is the energy of the ground state of these things uh, as a function of the nuclear separation. So I have two atoms, uh, for example, one carbon and one other carbon, and I can separate them uh, by a certain distance, and I can predict the ground state energy of this specific uh, state. So the red line is the exact solution that you can still perform for these uh, small molecules. Uh, and uh, the, this uh, green line points are the RDMs so of these neural network results. And you can see that uh, these are pretty much close to the exact one. Uh, for example, you can see zoom in on this region. They predict the correct dissociation energy, how it's called. Um, and they also, in some cases, get better results than uh, existing approaches uh, that people have used for, for years in quantum chemistry. For example, this couple cluster approach. This is true, especially for more collateral molecules. Uh, like uh, N2, where you can see maybe from this plot that these green points are you know, pretty much below these, uh, these, these, uh, these, the curves that you can obtain with other techniques. Of course, these are small molecules and there is a lot to be done in the future, but this tells you uh, a flavor of, again, how you can apply these techniques onto, onto uh, realistic uh, or close to realistic uh, uh, systems that are relevant also in some cases for chemistry. Uh, I will skip the, the, the large, uh, the large uh, if you want, table. You can find it in the paper. And uh, here, uh, as much as for the other cases, uh, the main problem is uh, that we encountered in improving the accuracy is, again, the number of samples that you need to learn the, the wave function. Even though here the challenge is, uh, is different, it stems from um, uh, essentially how uh, the correlations of the system are done. And the fact that there is a single uh, configuration that is dominating this artifact in the configuration um, that somehow um, spoils down all the others. Um, but again, also in this case, we found that one bottleneck is the sample size. So, but there are ways to improve on this. And, uh, uh, and again, this is sampling uh, issue, if you want, here is not related to what I presented before for the, for the J1. 
just also as a matter of, of reference to other works, uh, there have been uh, other approaches that are not based on this, uh, if you want to Jordan Wigner or David Kitar mapping on the lattice, that are instead based directly on the continuous space degrees of freedom for electrons. Uh, most notably, there's been um, some work in the group of um, uh, Frank Noé here in, in Berlin, his work that was uh, later published in, in Nature uh, Chemistry, where they use uh, these kind of uh, neural network architectures, and also this paper done by people in, uh, in uh, DeepMind, uh, so the Google DeepMind, who are now interested also in fermions. Um, and uh, uh, this is an alternative, these are alternative approach completely different uh, in, uh, in spirit, in the sense that they don't work on a lattice, but they work in a real space. But the essence also of this kind of approach is that if you uh, do things, uh, you know, and take networks that are relatively large, also for some larger system than what we study with our approach, you can get um, competitive uh, uh, energies and uh, start essentially having uh, results for more challenging systems that cannot be addressed with our techniques. Now, um, uh, I, I believe I have uh, 10 minutes. So please, Asya, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong. Well, we can go until 2.45, so together yes. with five. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, I, was, I, I wanted to reserve a few minutes for, uh, for, 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 for questions at the end. Um, so let me actually take already maybe a few questions because I, before going into my final part. Um, okay, so there is a uh, more than computing ground set energy. Is it possible to characterize phase transition uh, determining critical exponents? Uh, yes, so I mean, essentially, once you have the, the, the wave function, uh, you can compute, as Filippo was showing you, um, arbitrary um, operators, arbitrary expectation values of operators on these wave functions. So if you had to, for example, characterize a phase transition, you, want, you would like uh, typically to measure correlation functions of spins or any other um, uh, quantity that is important to characterize in the phase transition. Um, and uh, you can do that for, for different distances. And then uh, with that, uh, you can extract uh, with the standard techniques, uh, critical exponents um, and, uh, and determine uh, precisely where this phase transition uh, uh, exists. Um, so, okay, so we need to know certain parameters to do computation of a system. What are the parameters we approximate for machine learning codes? What are the inputs used in general for various system problem? Is network the same? Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure I understand uh, this question in detail. If you can please uh, uh, ask it again, uh, uh, clarifying uh, uh, what do you mean? What are the parameters we approximate for ML codes? This is the part of the question I don't understand. Um, NetCat, yeah, is a software that allow. It's not like vast for ability in the sense that it's uh, it's more you know, concentrated if you want on uh, on the discrete uh, systems, quantum systems, lattice quantum systems, and uh, um, and it is you know. We typically deal with smaller systems because we, we solve the, the Schrodinger equation, of the Schrodinger equation, not with a DFT approximation. So we try to, to solve a correlated uh, ground state for a correlated ground state. Uh, but I mean, the, the spirit is uh, of all these things is always to try to find the best approximation for the ground state. So uh, when you do DFT, you use a different approximation, which is not in general variational. Here, instead, we use an approximation which is variational and uh, better suited to, to characterize uh, quantum system where you have, you have strong interactions or correlations among the different uh, degrees of freedom. Um, so then there's another question. So you show that the case uh, when the coupling is nearest and is next nearest, but the, what we, if we are with long range coupling, uh, then do we need to find the neural networks? Um, well, I mean, one of the main uh, advantages of working with this kind of uh, architecture is that typically, if you modify a little bit the Hamiltonian, uh, this doesn't mean that the wave function uh, architecture sh should change too much. In this case of long range couplings, uh, if you allow your wave function to also have long range correlations, and this, as I showed you at the beginning, can happen if you have a deep neural network, sufficiently deep, then typically you can take the same kind of architecture. So you don't need to change too much the, the neural network. 
Um, so there's a nice, so he is using the Bravi. So I assume here you mean the Bravi and Kitai method give the same results. Um, yeah, unfortunately I didn't show this, but uh, um, uh, in practice, uh, the, the, yeah, this was a bit disappointing if you want, but uh, if you use this Bravi Kitai mapping, I mean, all these models, uh, the variational results that you get with our techniques are more or less equivalent to what you get with the Jordan Bigner. But this is not general. I mean, I believe that there are other cases where this mapping can be superior. You can get better, you know, better, better, um, or more easily to represent the wave function. Okay, so now let me move on uh, um, to my final part uh, of the of the of my presentation, and then I will take uh, more questions. I will be happy to get more questions. So, in the final part. So I will tell you something which is um, uh, related to, uh, again, uh, uh, going beyond the ground state properties, right? So until now I've told you that uh, uh, I have, uh, I'm interested in, uh, I was interested, we were interested in, uh, in finding uh, essentially approximations for these equations, so for, the, for this very important and famous eigenvalue equation for the ground state uh, uh, side zero of my Hamiltonian age. Okay? But uh, what if I want to do something that goes beyond the ground state? So one example that I will do, which is not strictly speaking in the realm or not yet of condensed matter, but uh, it's pretty much related, uh, it's, it's, the, it's what people call the quantum circuits. So um, the, the idea is that uh, in, in that case, uh, what you do is that you want to simulate, so you want to, if you want to generate a state, okay? So let's call it psi of, of k, okay? which is uh, the, the, the result of the application of, of a sequence of unitaries. So uh, that goes uh, like this, so uk, uk minus one, uh, uk minus two, up to u1 on some initial state psi. Uh, sorry, this is not very clear because I don't have much space here, but uh, um, so let me rewrite this. Uh, in a better way. So in, a, in what a quantum circuit is, for those of you who have never heard about quantum circuits, is the very simple statement. So that uh, I, I want to generate a state psi k, which is the result of the action of a sequence of unitaries u. So unitary operators. onto some initial, uh, possibly trivial, if you want, uh, uh, state psi zero. Okay. So the output of the circuit then is uh, this psi k, so the, the general, the state, the state that you generated at, at the end after you've applied this sequence of unitary operators. Okay. Now, um, so this is of course very relevant because for example, when you do real time dynamics with the Schrodinger equation, you know that the unitary that, that, you, that you approximate in that case is just if the Hamilton is time independent, it's just the exponential of minus i uh, h, assuming each part is equal to ht, assuming that, um, that uh, so, so let me, so in the case of, uh, for example, standard, uh, let's say, unit dynamics, and the Hamiltonian that is time independent, in this case, this would be your unit at u, right? That depends in general on t. So for, you can generalize these to, to case where you take other kind of unitaries, and this is what a quantum circuit is. Okay. So just to, to give you um, uh, an idea, there is then this notion of, of, of gates. So a gates is essentially uh, those, the unit that you put here in the circuits. Um, and there is a universal set of gates. So essentially a set of unitaries, local unitaries, lo local means that, uh, as Philippe was saying, that acts only on one or two spins, for example, qubits in this case. Um, and you can show that you can generate an arbitrary quantum circuit, but just using, for example, a set of three uh, so-called universal gates. So one, uh, for example, that I will consider is the Adamar gate. This is a, a rotation, um, a local rotation that uh, amounts essentially to uh, putting you in the basis of the sigma x operator. Or you can do a rotation uh, in the z direction. So these are z by some angle phi phi, or you can do a so-called control z rotation onto q. Okay. So it, these are just, if you want, the building blocks that you can use 
to build a more complicated quantity. Now, I mean, what you can do is that you can show that if you have a neural network, so if you have a wave function that is represented by a neural network, so a very simple neural network like an RBM, so again, a one layer uh, deep network, so very simple minded, you can show that you can apply to, to these neural networks, these gates, uh, um, uh, and get out uh, another neural network typically. So for example, if you apply this gate here on this qubit, so this is now my set of my qubits, I imagine that I apply my gate, so my unitary only on this, uh, on this uh, qubit here, you can show that the, the neural network that will result out of this operation is another neural network with some of the weights modified, uh, uh, depending on the, on the file. Um, the same thing is true if you do uh, this, uh, this uh, control z rotation, which is uh, um, applied in this case on two qubits, so this is a so-called two qubit operator. And then uh, you, you can show that also in this case, uh, the, the resulting neural network will have uh, uh, essentially, uh, will be just, just slightly larger than the previous one, but you can also write it down exactly. So the application of these two gates is, can be done in an exact way. There is, however, this uh, Adamar gate, which is, uh, again, uh, the, the only one remaining to implement uh, all the universal possible circuits that cannot be applied exactly. So it's known uh, by, from this paper that if you apply an Adamar gate onto a generic neural network, you cannot generate uh, another, strictly speaking, neural network, which has a simple form like in this case. Okay? So what you can do in this case, however, is to use uh, another variational principle which uh, is, uh, if you want, more general than the one uh, that uh, we've seen so far for, for ground states. And uh, uh, the idea is the following. So imagine that I have uh, my neural network state, so psi w. So this is an arbitrary neural network that depends on some parameters uh, w, okay? Then I act with a unitary that in this case is just this Adamar gate. So just beware that now H is not the Hamiltonian anymore, but it's this Adamar gate. So this is a uh, a local unitary uh, that, uh, that acts on some qubit and that acts on this uh, quantum state. Okay? So in general, the output state will be another quantum state phi. Okay? Now, what, what we know is that in general, this is quantum state phi is not another uh, neural network. Otherwise we would have solved the problem exactly. However, what we can try to do is that we can try to approximate this state phi, which in general is an arbitrary quantum state with another neural network that, that has this time some parameters w prime. Okay? So you see the problem. I have a genetic state phi and I want to approximate it with another with a neural network that has some parameters w prime. So this is now an approximation problem because I want to somehow match these two quantum states as closely uh, as possible. So if you want, what you can do is that you can uh, minimize, instead of minimizing the energy as you do for the ground state, you can define a cost function, so the thing that you want to minimize in this machine learning approach, the, the overlap, or in, I mean, in this case, we use the logarithm of the overlap, but this is a minus log of the overlap, but this is not uh, that important. So you can maximize the overlap or minimize uh, the, the, log min the log minus log of the overlap. But I mean, essentially you see that um, when phi is equal, uh, sorry, when psi of w prime is equal to phi, this overlap here would be equal to one uh, and the log of one will be zero. So this loss function will be equal to zero. Okay? Otherwise, if psi is close, uh, is not close enough to phi, then this loss function will be non-zero. So, so you see that uh, this is a sort of energy if you want for your system. So this L that depends on this parameter w prime, and it will be exactly zero only when the two quantum states are identical. Okay. So we can play the same game that we played before the ground state, but this time minimizing not the energy, but this uh, loss function, which is the, the infidelity from the log of it's related to the infidelity. So, uh, so why do we care about this? Well, we care about this because we want to see, for example, how hard it is classically to simulate a quantum computer. So for example, if we actually need to, to run a certain quantum algorithm on a quantum computer, or if we can try to hope to approximate that certain quantum model on a classical computer. Okay. So most of the hardness results that we know, so most of the things that people will tell you is that uh, this is a, a desperate task because the quantum computer is much more expressive 
than a classical computer. You can encode the exponential many states um, that you cannot do classically. This is, uh, I mean, uh, valid argument, but uh, in the most practical cases, uh, this is uh, this is not uh, entirely correct because there is uh, several quantum uh, algorithms that can be efficiently approximated classically. So understanding where the limit between quantum uh, computing and classical computing lies is very important also for the development of quantum computing um, itself. Okay. So for example, I mean, let's take a very simple example. So what we do is, uh, is uh, apply a sequence of Adamar gates, so this H, one on each spin on each qubit for an initial state, which is uh, the ground state of uh, the transfer field that involves. So this is one of the spin models that I was uh, telling you about uh, before. So this is the overlap that you get out of this variational result. And you can see that you can get um, pretty high overlaps at the end of, uh, uh, of the circuit. So essentially the, the final state is identified by one in these units. And you see that the final overlaps that you can get, for example, on as large as 60 qubits, so what we can do these days experimentally, uh, is around uh, you know, 98 or something uh, in, in this kind of applications, even for two dimensional systems. Um, and uh, so, for example, what you can do is that you can compare the error that you make um, in this approach. So again, we are trying to estimate this quantum state with, uh, with, uh, with a classical neural network. So we are going to make an error in this approximation. Okay? But if you run the same quantum model on, on a computer, on a quantum computer, also the final state that you will get in the quantum computer will not be exact. So this will be affected by, for example, noise. So you will have decoherence, the fact that your qubits are interacting with the external environment, you, the, the, these qubits are talking to one, to one another. There's all sorts of noise that can disrupt your quantum uh, computation. So, and uh, this is an exercise that we did in this paper that has been also retaken uh, by, done later by other people. But I mean, essentially you can compare this variational noise. And so if you want effective error that you make in, in the variational simulation, to the noise that you have on the quantum computer. And you can see, for example, so this is the kind of um, accuracy that you get for these uh, simulations with the neural network. So he, this is the overlap that we get. So this is the uh, straight line here. Uh, and uh, this is the, instead the error that you get on the quantum computer when you, when you, when you, when you change the noise. You, this was a simulation of the noise, not an actual device, but a realistic simulation. And you can see that uh, Essentially, if you want to achieve the same accuracy that you have with the neural network, you need to have a noise level on the single qubit noise that is uh, relatively small. So this is uh, comparable, uh, actually it's uh, below what people can do these days, even with state-of-the-art uh, uh, you know, qubits. Uh, and you see, you know, again, uh, um, this tells you that uh, classical computing is very competitive with, uh, even for the simulations of, of uh, complex uh, quantum circuits. Um, and, uh, you know, one should also uh, always keep in mind that um, uh, one source of noise, which in the classical case is due to your approximation power, uh, it, it can be comparable to another source of noise in the, in the actual hardware, which is due to the coherence. So this is the main message. Um, I will just flash one of the more recent results that we have on, uh, on another uh, approach, which is called uh, another more complicated quantum algorithm, which is called uh, um, the, um, the QAOA, quantum uh, approximate optimization algorithms. And so this is, uh, um, I, mean, I mean, I won't go too much into the details, but it's discussed, discussed in this paper. This is what also uh, Google has popularized recently with, uh, with, uh, with a work where they do this, uh, uh, where they implement this algorithm on, on their quantum hardware, so this famous um, uh, quantum supremacy, uh, if you want, uh, uh, architecture that they used uh, last year. They've also run this, uh, this paper, this, uh, this kind of circuits on, on their hardware. Um, and I mean, we've shown that um, in this work, uh, recent work, more recent work that, uh, again, with, with an RBM, a very simple minded RBM, you can uh, describe, do a very good job at describing also the output of this kind of circuits. Um, and, uh, you know, the kind of fidelity that you can achieve. So again, the accuracy on these approximations uh, in the regions of interest. For the, for the algorithm are very good uh, and compared also to what you can get on the other. Uh, so, and, uh, and, and, and the important point is that you can also scale uh, this up to, you know, very large number, um, relatively large number of qubits, 54 qubits. This is, these are our simulations for 54 qubits. 
And for example, for this uh, amount of, 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 of gates, so if you want for this large CPU that we studied, we get an accuracy which we believe at the moment uh, is not achievable in, in the actual experiment. Okay, so this is, was a comparison with tensor networks. I will skip it, um, but in an essence, uh, you cannot simulate the circuits with sensor networks. If you want, I can tell you why later. Uh, there is uh, uh, our software, which is NetCat. You've already seen about this by from Filippo. I reiterate uh, that uh, this software is uh, uh, completely open source. You can uh, download it, work on it, contribute to it if you want. Uh, we have a GitHub repository where you can uh, also uh, submit your issues if you have problems or if there's something that you don't understand. We can try, we will try to, uh, we will do our best to, to revive your questions. Uh, there is a release uh, 3.0 coming soon, uh, and you will see that it is based on this uh, JAX, uh, which is a very nice framework developed by Google to handle uh, neural networks. Okay, so did, I will uh, then leave my, my, my last slide, which is about challenges, open things, mostly related to fermions or uh, optimizing the design phases, for example, in the circuits. Um, but uh, the, the main message that I want to, to, to give you today is that uh, um, if you are interested in, uh, in studying uh, you know, quantum system, interacting quantum system, there is a good chance, I mean, it's not a guarantee, of course, that if you represent that uh, the wave function uh, with a uh, neural network, you can find uh, typically a good approximation for uh, the, the kind of properties that you are interested in. Of course, there is a lot of uh, research going on. There are problems where we don't manage to, to do this uh, as good as we would like. So one example was this infamous 0.5 point in the J1, J2, but there are other examples. Um, so, this is why you know this is a research, and that's why we we are here. Uh, but uh, you know it's only you know thanks to the new generations that we will uh, um, extend uh, you know uh, these uh, these applications and find also more interesting results in the future. So thank you, and uh, uh, I will try now to to answer some of your questions. Okay, thanks, Giuseppe. So uh, I'm not sure from the last time if uh, some new questions arrive or you want to check yourself the, the box yeah um so um i mean there's a general question on uh, yeah on on codes in condensed matter so i guess this is not directly related to what i presented today um can these ideas be used no, another question is can these ideas be used in high temperature superconductivity um i mean potentially yes uh in high temperature superconductivity. i mean there are some simplified models of uh, high temperature superconductors so the famous upper model um which is not realistic but simplified and i mean in this kind of applications uh what you deal with is a fermionic hamiltonian which is written in terms of the uh, C and C diagonal operators, and you can try um, to essentially find the ground state, for example, these Hamiltonians, and see if these support uh, superconductivity. So superconductivity, in that case, is something that can be measured if you want on the on the wave function. Uh, has anybody done this uh, yet? Uh, the answer is no, because this is a challenging uh, calculation. Uh, we did something related to this, but not exactly the upper model. Um, but uh, I forecast uh, that this year there will be a lot of papers on, on this topic, so um, you can stay tuned on this. Um, so this is done. So uh, can I su can su suggest uh, uh, some interesting uh, problems to work on for uh, pursuing a PhD? Um, yeah, so there is a... a, a several lines of research. So one that I was mentioning is related to understanding how many samples, for example, do we need to learn, uh, so to, to approximate a given wave function. Um, so this is something that should be exploited, uh, explored more. Um, another thing would be, for example, uh, uh, understanding a better, have a better understanding or actually uh, impose symmetries in a better way than we are doing now. Um, there are some family of symmetries uh, that uh, are harder to, to encode. 
um, uh, these are a bit more technical, but like SU2 symmetry is a symmetry that is not so easy to enforce, for example, using neural networks. So uh, a general flavor of uh, one of the things that people are working a lot on in, in these days is really understanding how to enforce symmetries in, uh, in neural networks that are used for physics. And also in quantum physics, this is uh, one of the main hot topics. So the symmetries in neural networks. So uh, when considering uh, um, a specific Hamiltonian, how do you initialize the neural network? The term is depth and other architecture aspects. Yeah, okay. So this is the, 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 um, the one million dollar question. Uh, you, you, you don't have a uh, general recipe because otherwise you would have solved essentially um, all problems that are affecting uh, uh, humankind. Um, but uh, um, so what you do is that you start typically, I mean, it's the same strategy that people adopt in uh, machine learning, essentially. So you know that a certain architecture, for example, convolutional neural network has been shown to be very effective at uh, identifying images in two dimensions. And it is very effective for a lot of applications on two dimensional objects. And indeed, uh, we starting from this uh, idea, we've taken uh, this convolutional state, uh, neural networks, and use them also for two-dimensional quantum problems, and found out that uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, I mean, unless you have other, uh, other issues, but in, in uh, let's say standard problems, also for quantum problems in two dimensions, this work. So the idea is that you have to start typically from where somebody has already investigated. I mean, unless you are the first to do that, but then you are you have to do a bit more work. But if you are studying uh, something that is related, for example, if you take a two-dimensional spin model, you would know at this point that a good architecture are convolutional neural networks. Uh, so this is the idea. You look at uh, um, a certain uh, class of architectures that people have already worked on and try to improve them. Um, So there's a question, uh, NetCat is based on machine learning, but it requires a few steps to optimize the ground state energy. So how it would be different from the standard DFT method? Uh, uh, yeah. So the DFT method is not based on the wave function, as you know. Uh, so it's based um, essentially on the density functional and it's based on, on another quantity, which is the density, so not uh, the wave function, which is instead a more, much more complicated object. Um, so the two uh, approaches are very different. Again, the, the, the density functional theory is not uh, in its uh, practical incarnations, a variational theory. Uh, so the approximation that you can get uh, can be uncontrolled um, in the sense that the energies, for example, you can get can be lower than the exact energies. Uh, in uh, uh, our case, this is not possible in the sense that the energy is strictly larger than, uh, than the exact energy. Um, so is it possible to, to apply these ideas to similar ground state phase transition of skirmions in a 2D LE magnet? Uh, uh, why not? <laughs> I mean, uh, you can try, yes. I mean, uh, that's the, um, if you have Hamiltonian and you can write it uh, in terms of, uh, of local operators, I mean, uh, local Pauli uh, matrices, for example, you can, uh, you, you can try to use NetCat and see how well uh, you can approximate its ground state. Uh, can it happen that the entanglement or coherence be destroyed by these neural networks? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by destroyed by these neural networks. Mm, so these are intrinsically classical objects. So there is no, uh, so the description, so the wave function, uh, if you want, it's a classical description of the quantum system. So there is no, um, uh, intrinsic, uh, if you want, collapse when you work with a classical wave function. So um, the collapse happens when you actually measure the, the quantum system, and this is not what we do in, uh, in, this, uh, in this case. So here we use a classical representation of the quantum system. That's what we work with. Okay. So I, I think uh, we can now finish. I mean, there are a lot of questions. And uh, so thank you so much, Zep, and also you. For, for your presentations. So I hope you enjoyed everyone, the participants and also the lectures. So yeah, thanks. And um, so next week we'll have the last um, the last lecture on the
machine learning in condensed matter by Juan Carasquilla. So it's the topics are more or less similar. So yeah, see you all then and uh, enjoy this week. So thanks. Thanks to everyone. Bye. Thank you, Giuseppe. Next time, interested. Yeah, I hope so. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.